Next, uh, pleased to welcome uh, our next speaker, uh, Catherine Tyner from the FDA. Uh, she is the Acting Associate Director for Science uh, in the Office of Pharma Pharmaceutical Quality and Cedar Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at FDA. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I am just thrilled to be talking about the impact of all of these programs that we've been hearing about and the impact that it has on, on the review of drug products. And since it's Clinom, I'm going to be talking about drug products containing nanomaterials. So since I'm at the FDA, what I'm talking about is my opinion, and I am not endorsing the products I'm just about to talk about. Regulatory science. So FDA has defined regulatory science as the science of developing new tools, standards, and approaches to assess the safety, efficacy, and quality, again, it's something you always hear when you talk about FDA, and the performance of all FDA-regulated products. I, I can't, can't stress enough of how much of an impact regulatory science has on the review of drug products. It impacts every single part of our process, from the review of the applications to inspection and surveillance, to the formation of our standards and policy development. And that's as it should be if we're working truly going to be a science-led and patient-focused organization. It impacts all aspects of all drugs, so new drugs, generic drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and biotechnology products. Uh, there are many, so there, uh, the FDA has prioritized regulatory science initiatives and priority areas for all, all of regulatory science. And the ones that I've highlighted in red are ones that I'm going to be specifically talking about today because really the current research portfolio, these are, these are the topics that, that are, are being addressed currently. All right, so because it's with FDA and we don't have definitions, we, I want to qualify all about what nano is. Um, just as a reminder, FDA does not separate nanotechnology products from other products, so there's no special flagging and the products that contain nanotechnology or nanomaterials go through the same standards and regulatory process as products that do not contain nanomaterials. We also do not have a definition for nanomedicine, nanotechnology, or related terms. We work under this umbrella of points to consider that came out in a finalized guidance in 2014. And those two points involve whether or not a material is roughly in the nanoscale, so 1 to 100 nanometers, or whether or not there's a special feature that's associated with the size of that nanomaterial, and that goes up to 1,000 nanometers. So that's what I'll be working in when I'm talking about nanotechnology today. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, there's over 60 products that have been approved and are on the U.S. market that contain nanomaterials, and this is obviously just a selection of some of those products. But I like this, this table because it really does highlight the diversity of the types of materials that we're seeing, as well as the indications of, of what those products are used for. And another thing is the timelines that we're seeing. So we have products that are, that are fairly old and are old enough that they're now in the life cycle where we're starting to talk about generic forms. Okay, what are the considerations for drug products containing nanomaterials that regulatory science can address? And so as we've conducted risk assessment and looking at areas that you know, could benefit from a little bit more knowledge, we've highlighted four main areas. One is that the PK profiles of the parent drug and the drug encapsulated in nanoparticles um, is oftentimes different than the free or unbound drug. And oftentimes that's exactly why the company has formulated this product to change the PK profile. But it does call into question some of the things that are typically seen in PK studies, such as area under the curve, blood concentrations. If the particle's not in the blood, you can't really do those traditional measurements. So that uh, impacts how we, we look at ways, and so that falls under the priority of modernizing toxicology. Uh, nanomaterials may also enhance the delivery of drugs to certain tissues. Again, that's oftentimes why we're going nano in the first place. But if you have this this new uh, biodistribution, you can also cause new side effects and new toxicities because you're having organs that are seeing a much higher concentration of the product than they would initially. So again, that would fall under looking at techniques that we could look at to modernize toxicology. Nanomaterials can have physical and chemical stability challenges. That really falls into the quality aspects, product manufacturing and quality. And my, my personal favorite topic, which is specialized analytical methods are often needed to characterize these nanomaterials. 
And so that helps uh, ensure that FDA is ready to look at innovative and emerging technologies. So I presented this slide yesterday, and I just want to highlight a couple of different parts in the slide. So CEDAR maintains a robust regulatory and re regulatory research profile, not just in nanomaterials, but in other aspects as well. And we do this through internal projects, um, both paper-based as well as laboratories. We have on-site laboratories that we do the research. Um, extramural funding, so external grants. And then what we're going to really talk more about today, the collaborations and training programs. So we have multiple training opportunities that are available through the FDA for people throughout their career to come and interface with us and learn about how the FDA works. Uh, the research may focus on product-specific, kind of class-based products. So, you know, where we have a general idea of such as like liposomes or just general academic questions that we need surrounding nanomaterials and drug products. And we usually work, try to kind of focus on the class because that's a good sweet spot for something that's not too general or too specific. And those research projects uh, fall into a couple of categories, including quality, emerging, emerging analytical technologies, farm talks, and also equivalence issues. All right, so I want to give two examples of, of some areas that we've worked on for regulatory science and, and the training programs we have associated with it. So the first is liposomes. So liposomes account for about a third of the nanotechnology products that we see in CEDAR. And so we have multiple regulatory research science projects that are focused on both the product and process understanding. And all of these have had some type of training aspect associated with it. So the first one is, is, was a paper project, and it was developmental considerations for liposomal drug products. And it involved us looking at all of the submissions we've seen coming into the Food and Drug Administration, looking at the different issues we've seen, seeing some commonalities, seeing what the profile of this entire project. And if you're interested in that project, there's a citation down there. But in terms of the training, this was something that we uh, took advantage of the ORISE program. So the ORISE program is a way that the FDA is, is one of the main FDA training programs that we take advantage of. And it's a way that we can bring in students from high school students all the way to professors that are on sabbatical to come in, work at the FDA, do hands-on research, and really get a good sense of what we're doing. And so uh, if you really want to have a good sense of the regulatory process and what is in an IND application, you can get your ORISE fellow uh, security clearance and have them dig through it and ask some very, very fundamental questions. So it's a very nice way to get this hands-on fundamental understanding of the review process. Uh, the second project is one that we use a different type of training, and it was using quality by design concepts to systematically evaluate liposomal drug formulation development. So this was the idea to uh, form an in-depth understanding of the risks involved of liposomal drug formulations and manufacturing, and the manufacturing uh, pro and being able to manufacture products with consistent quality. So really, uh, more of a manufacturing quality CMC aspect, and the results of that research are published down here. And the reason why I want to highlight this project is because it was a joint collaboration between a laboratory at the FDA and a laboratory in the University of Connecticut. So it had a, a complete graduate, graduate study, student, uh, summer students, undergraduate students, as well as postdocs, interfacing directly with the FDA scientists, again, to come up with something that was going to eventually increase the knowledge base, facilitate quality, safety, and efficacy. Ultimately, this is going to benefit both the regulatory review and industry. But it's really neat for the students and the trainees is that they work on this, this project. And at the time, it can seem very focused. But as the years go by, because it takes several years for the research to translate into policy, it can be a, a slow process. They actually can see that as they go by, that, that several years down the road, they worked on that project. They can actually see where the research that they did impacted policy. The second example I want to give is, is in regards to standards. And I know that standards have been brought up multiple times throughout this conference this year just because of the impact and the, and the critical um, aspect of having standardized methods and standardized materials that we can use to characterize these products. So special analytical methods are needed to characterize nanomaterials appropriately. And this falls into things such as detection. So being able to detect the nanomaterials just 
just in general, but also when they're in the blood and in the body. Uh, characterization and control of those nanomaterials materials and more of a quality aspect. And I call these kind of the, the, the gateway questions because they're, they're very academic in nature, although they, they translate and can impact the regulatory science, but it's a way to kind of grasp people, get them to work on these projects that have a lot of intellectual questions surrounding them, but then you can funnel them to the regulatory science. And so we have research efforts um, in emerging analytical technology, and this is the project that's near and dear to my heart because it's one that I actually have that's lab-based right now. Um, and so this is an example of one of the projects we're doing. It's, it's looking at complex products and then using high-resolution imaging and chemical analysis to try to determine where the drug is in the product as well as the microstructure. And I highlight this because we took advantage of yet another training program that we we have at the FDA, and this was a practice school. And it's a practice school that we have in collaboration with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which brings teams of three graduate students, puts them into the lab for a very fixed amount of time with a very specific challenge that they need to overcome. And so they, at this point, they were actually looking, if you see these are streaks, we were getting a lot of um, inconsistent and a lot of vibrations in the room. So we had a suite of engineering students come in and they were doing things like walking past the instrument, closing a door, opening a can of Coke by the instrument, which you should never do because you're in the lab, by the way, um, and finding ways that they were able to find and qualify those, those vibrations. Ultimately, they were able to give us very specific recommendations of how to isolate this instrument so we could get sharper images, but at the same time, these engineering students were then able to be working with, with formulations that we had a lot of questions about and could see how the questions and how the work they were doing ultimately could impact the review and approval of these products. So looking at emerging analytical techniques, and then also when we have these emerging techniques, one of the issues that we come across is standard, standardization. Let's look at my time real quick. So when we have an emerging technique, actually any analytical method that we use, you need to have data that establishes the analytical procedures, are uh, meeting proper standards of accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and re reproducibility, and that they're fit for use. And so all of that is considered the validation package. And when we work with this, we work with a lot in terms of standard, prepper, uh, standard preparation. So CETA participates in standard development for drug products containing nanomaterials to ensure the availability of documentary standards and standard reference materials to companies and CROs. And why is that important? Well, if we go back to the validation and we take a look at this slide. So this is one of the slides that we came up with after we did the analysis of the profile of products we've seen over the years. Our points to consider have been at times contentious because uh, for the definitions or lack of definitions of nanomaterials, sometimes they go up to 100. The fact that we went up to 1,000 raised some eyebrows, perhaps. And so we were able to take a look at the types and the sizes of materials that we were seeing and actually do a breakdown and see, well, okay, if we say that we go up to 1,000 nanometers, how much actually go up to that? And we found that the majority of the products we were seeing fall below 300 nanometers, and a very good portion fall below 100 nanometers. And that becomes important because when you start to work for validation and you're showing fit for purpose, Let's take size, for example. You need to show that you can measure the size. Well, there are very few standard reference materials that are available in the size of, say, 10 nanometers. And so people are trying to validate their instruments for a particle that's like 5 to 10 nanometers, and they have to do it with something that's over one, 100 nanometers. So that becomes a, a regulatory gap that we identify, but that we can throw to regulatory training programs, as well as standard organizations such as ASTM, ISO, and USP to help push for the development of both documentary standards for these uh, emerging technologies, as well as the reference materials to qualify and um, to be able to validate the, those instruments. And again, this is one of those gateway ways that we can get labs into regulatory science because you can have things such as round robin testing, which is a very, very amenable to have a grad student come in and participate in round robin testing, and it gets them involved in the standards process, which again will benefit the regulatory science. Okay, so in summary, FDA and CEDAR continue to foster innovation and the responsible development of drug products containing nanomaterials. <coughs> Excuse me. Regulatory science and research forms the foundation of all aspects 
of the risk-based evaluation of drug products. It's, it's absolutely critical. And FDA CEDAR is becoming more active in the development of consensus standards for the development of drug products containing nanomaterials because ultimately the available, uh, availability of standards improves the quality and timeliness of drug products emissions and the corresponding reviews. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions you might have and also acknowledge the people that contributed to those slides.